Hi there, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's event. Uh, this one at 6 p.m. Pacific, so we're running a little late, but um, today's session is focusing on the developer and partnering with the Linux Foundation uh, helps Delta Lake to build a flourishing community. So a little bit about ourselves. Um, Oh, there we go. Hi there, my name is Denny Lee. I'm a staff developer, oh, senior staff developer, I already forgot to update that, for Databricks um, Developer Relations. I'm a contributor to Apache Spark, MLflow, and as well as a Delta Lake maintainer. Uh, pre previous to that, I was a principal program manager at uh, Microsoft for the Azure Cosmos DB, Project Isotope, which is known as HD Insight, SQL Server, and Bing. Um, before, Senior Director of Data Science Engineering at SAP Concur. And uh, yeah, that's the most important aspects for myself. And allow uh, Carly. Hi, everyone. My name is Carly Akerley, and I am a Marketing and Communications Specialist at the Linux Foundation. I have been with the LF for a little over four years, and I've worked with a variety of open source projects. Um, currently, I work with MLflow and Delta Lake. Um, I specialize in social media, uh, management, content creation, email, and events. I'm also a graduate of the University of Dayton with a degree in marketing and business administration. Perfect. So if you have any questions for this wonderful crowd here, by all means, please ask. Uh, if you do not are not familiar with Delta Lake, uh, Delta Lake is an open source storage framework uh, that enables building a lake house architecture with compute engines, including Spark, PrestoDB, Flink, Trino, uh, and Hive, and APIs for Java, Scala, Spark, uh, Rust, Ruby, and Python. And say that three times fast. Um, it is the foundation of your lake house. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the term, yes, I'll freely admit the fact that it's a marketing term, but the key context is that when the age of transitioning from databases to data lakes, the reality is there are pros and cons to both approaches. And Lake Houses takes the best of these two worlds in terms of the manageability, simplicity, and the transactional reliability of databases with the flexibility and scalability of a data lake. And hence the concept of a lake house. And so how did Delta get here before we talk about the growth of the community? Just to provide a little bit of context. So before, when we, before we even had Delta Lake in 2017, the good is that at Databricks, we had these awesome distributed Spark frameworks that were processing lots and lots of data. So that was really, really good. So we were super, super happy about that. The bad, in reality ugly, was that files do not equal a database. There's a lot of transactions that failed, corruptions of the data, data quality was a problem, there was no scheme enforcement. Uh, when you added the cloud, there was a whole new set of complexities. Um, loading large tables became extremely, extremely slow. Okay, so that's what the state in 2017. When we then, and during Spark and AI Summit in 2017, we're going, ah, man, there's gotta be a better way. And so, in 2018, we announced Databricks Delta. Cool project, fully transactional uh, storage system that preserves the best of the cloud, the flexibility of the cloud, but also provides the reliability for the data. And then we had Dominic Brzezinski from Apple go ahead and present on stage how his system was processing petabytes of data. So really cool, battle tested by hundreds of customers, we're super happy, but we actually had to open source Delta. Why? Because there's a massive output of users from the community who are saying, we need to have this project and not just work on Spark, but work on other projects. So in 2019, we open sourced Delta Lake. Uh, it, the, we open sourced the protocol, we open sourced the features, and we ensured that every single system that went out there was battle tested. So yay, so we're all happy now, right? But we actually had to build a community even though we had these really cool numbers, these are the numbers that we have now, okay? The reality is we had to build a community to ensure Delta Lake actually would be successful whether Databricks was involved or not, okay? So right now, these are the numbers from Databricks, and these are last year's numbers, okay? So 1.7 exabytes of data processed a day. Not stored, processed, okay? Uh, 7,000 customers in production, and because of the work that Carly, myself, and the rest of Delta Lake community worked together on, we were able to see a 663% increase in contributor strength. That's a Linux Foundation metric that comes directly from Alphex Insights, which I believe Carly will talk about a little bit later. 
So this is really cool, but how did we get here? And that's actually the purpose of this particular conversation today, okay? And part of it starts with the organizations. We had lots of organizations that contribute directly to Delta Lake. This is a, just a small subset of some of the logos that are involved. That's cool, but how did we get here? And that's the crux of the, today's conversation, which is when you build open source communities, you build them one developer at a time. That's the most crucial aspect. This idea that you can simply go ahead and say, I build an open source project, I prop it into GitHub, and everything magically works well by itself is a fallacy. You actually have to build up relationships with developers one person at a time. And so we're gonna talk about these key concepts, and so I'll just jump right into it. Start, like I said, it's all about the developers. The reason I like calling this particular concept out is because it's crucial for everyone to understand that when you're working with users or contributors to your project, doesn't matter if it's open source or not, they're actually taking a career bet on your project. Okay, if they're taking career bet, that means their own career status is based on the success of the project and also the success of the project to boost them. Unless you remember that basic tenant, the reality is the project and the people who work on that project will not succeed. And so that's what we gotta go do. And so it goes into this idea that developers are the heart of that community. This is not just in the domain of open source. A lot of the practices that I've talked about today, in fact, we practiced right when it was with SQL Server, in fact, and SQL Server from Microsoft, not really known, especially at that time, for being an open source advocate. Doesn't matter, because the whole premise is that we actually cared about the individual developer. And so, and so when now we switch back to open source, why do these developers care about contributing? Well, part of it is just things like communication skills, right? We, writing skills are extremely important to begin with. And guess what? Engineers, how do they communicate with each other? They write, okay? If they don't know how to write, guess what? They can't actually get across their point, especially when they're across multiple time zones. And so Amazon's famous for that writing culture. And basically, it's a requirement whether for remote teams to be extremely effective. And so that's why we call that out. You actually have to ensure your communication skills are strong. You don't have to be the most verbose, you don't have to be the most uh, salesy, but you have to ensure that you know how to communicate. Maybe you don't want to speak, that's fine, but you have to know how to write. All right. Another important aspect is the collaboration skills. We actually are working together with other people from across multiple time zones. Uh, it's hard when people are in different time zones to work together. Really, really hard, in fact. So that's why the writing skills are so important because that way we can communicate with each other at asynchronously. In other words, somebody is actually writing something at 9 a.m. Uh, in China, then somebody's reading it at 9 a.m. Pacific. Guess what? Unless they're writing it down clearly and cleanly, they're not gonna understand each other, okay? And what's even more brutal than that, they often are working with not just different organizations, but potentially competing organizations. They're actually fighting with each other. But guess what? When it comes to these open source projects, they're still gonna find ways to collaborate. If you know how to actually work together in these type of communities where technically the companies are, are competing, guess what? You can probably do a really good job in whatever company you're in, okay? So another important aspect, which is very common, not just in engineering, but just in terms of business, technical stewardship and mentorship. The idea that you're gonna go ahead and actually help individuals out, help them become better writers, better engineers, better communicators, doesn't matter. The idea is that you're actively helping each other out. This is a super crucial aspect when it comes to building these type of communities and building these type of projects. Unless we're helping each other out, what happens if you have a developer who says, hey, this project's really cool. They go ahead and ask a question, crickets. Nobody's answering anything. What happens when you do that? They feel like, oh, the community's not gonna help me. Well, then I don't feel like learning. I don't feel like helping that project because nobody's gonna help me out, right? So this is why technical stewardship and mentorship is so important. And then, especially in this day and age, uh, even before the current layoffs this season that we're currently seeing with a lot of different technical companies, the reality is the most important, at least from an engineering perspective, technical resume is not what you write in LinkedIn, though that's important, so please do that, okay? I'm not trying to tell you not to do that. The most important one is that one right there, which is your technical resume, which is what? Your GitHub repo. How active are you? How much stuff are you doing? 
Carly's going to talk a little bit more about some of the tools that companies use to understand some of these things as well, to assess. But this is just a one quick screenshot saying how green, i.e. how active, are you contributing to projects? If that thing isn't green all over the place, automatically most companies are going to say, oh, you're not actually writing any code. Guess what? You're not an engineer. Forget it. We're done. Okay? And so <clears throat> this leads me into this concept of branding for thee before branding for me. Okay? So this is, uh, seems that I'm trying to be Shakespearean, and maybe I am. But the context is when it comes to working within the, the realm of these developer communities, the job of the stewards of the community is to boost the other individuals in that community versus boosting themselves. That's actually their job. So for example, I'm a Delta Lake maintainer. My job is not to boost me. My job is to boost the other people who are contributing, whether they're maintainers or not, to boost them so they're better known. Guess what? Why? Why do I care about that? Remember how I started off? It's about their career prospects. They're betting their career on your project. If they're betting their career on their project, if I'm boosting them, then they're likely to have better career prospects. So guess what? That's my job. My job is to actually help them. By me boosting them, that actually helps boost me. So I still achieve my goal because I like being, I like being paid too. But the context is the job is to branding for them, not before myself. That's what the context. So like I said, I like the fact that I talk about Shingo Okawa. This, he's a relatively new contributor to the Delta community. I probably, I want to say this was like from four weeks ago, in fact, okay? But guess what? He produced a Delta sharing project called Code of Zero. Pretty sweet. It's a really cool project, which is basically the Delta sharing protocol built on Rust. Awesome stuff. So as soon as he did that, what was the first thing that Carly, myself, and the other Delta maintainers did? We boosted him. We made sure he was blogged. We made sure he was socialized. We made sure other people were aware of his project so people could go and start contributing to that project or looking at the project or downloading the project, which is important because then now he's looking at the Delta Lake community as a way to boost him, which is super important. Some of these can be long-term relations. I like pointing these guys out, Jeff Freeman and Robert Thompson, because they're buddies of mine. <laughs> Simple as that, okay? Who would I, how long have I known them? I've known them since around 2000. Basically, uh, back, I think, when we were both in Bing, okay? They've went down a completely different path that I did. I went down the Spark path. They went down SQL Server. We worked on analysis versus cubes back together in 2000. Yet, right now in 2023, they're in T-Mobile. I'm in Databricks. And guess what we're talking about? Delta Lake. Pretty sweet because that's the whole purpose of developer relations. That's the whole purpose of building communities. These are long-standing relationships. These aren't like one times. These are things in which 23 years later, we're still working together. Completely different companies, doesn't matter. Or across different companies. Christina Taylor, she's awesome. Okay, I cannot overemphasize how cool of a data engineer she is. I've known her since Disney, Bread Finance, Carvana, and now Catalyst Software. Okay? So she's worked across multiple companies. She's advocated for Delta Lake. She's advocated for Databricks. So guess what? She is producing tons of great content and socializing and advocating for Delta Lake and Databricks across multiple different companies because we went through the process of helping boosting her right from the beginning. So it pays in dividends this, uh, when you go ahead and focusing on boosting other people in the community. And then now I'm going to switch to Carly. She can uh, go into this session. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Denny. That was great. <laughs> um, so as Denny mentioned, a lot of people are taking a career bet um, when they agree to work on an open source project. And the open source community is comprised of so many diverse individuals that need to work together. Um, as he mentioned, across time zones, um, across companies, but everyone's bringing something really unique to the table. Um, so for, I'd like to highlight just a few of our um, contributors and maintainers on Delta Lake. So um, we have our Tyler Croy, who actually codes live on Twitch, which is awesome. Um, people get to learn live and ask questions um, when he's working on Delta Rust. 
Um, he produces some awesome blog um, content. He's really active in the community and very involved in whether it be community office hours, um, D3L2 sessions. He's someone that you can really ask any questions to and he's there. Um, we also have uh, QP Howe, which you would be surprised um, because he literally built the Delta Rust protocol in two weekends. Um, <laughs> he is incredibly intelligent and brings a lot to the table on the Rust side. Um, and he's currently a software lead at Neuralink. Um, and he also has some really great content that we're able to boost on social, email, um, and help educate other community members on things that they may not know about um, within the Delta Rust project. Also, um, Christian Williams with Scribd built the Kafka, Kafka Delta Ingest um, to improve Kafka top kit topics um, and has presented at Data and AI Summit, uh, educating a lot of people on Rust as well. Awesome. Gerard is also um, excellent. And this is an example of actually a community um, highlight that we do. Um, we like to feature different community members on the Delta.io website um, through social and all that good stuff. So usually once a month, sometimes once every two months, um, we post a, a contributor at Delta Lake and give them a lot of recognition on our website. Um, so as you can see here, uh, we also pull quotes um, of how they like to work with Delta Lake and um, the open source community. Also, um, another way that we really like to boost and collaborate is through uh, in-person events, whether those be um, meetups or just getting together at actual summits. Um, it really builds a lot of camaraderie among the community members. Um, we get to celebrate wins, milestones, and we also can um, share different ideas of what everyone's working on. Um, but that seems to be an awesome way for people to really connect um, with who's working on the project. Okay. But um, when everyone's coding and developing, who is putting on the events, working on the social media, um, and that's a huge part of what the Linux Foundation and Delta Lake work on together is um, when they're working on the technical items, we're able to boost that through email um, and social media. So one of the tools that we use is LFX Insights. Um, as you can see here, we have two different charts pulled. Um, one's contributor strength, the other one's total commits um, across all of the repositories. So um, GitHub contributors are, we sync um, all of their data to LFX Insights and we're able to view the activity in one single view. Um, we like to also let the community know what we're working on, um, how we're doing. So we send out a quarterly contribution report um, to the entire community with key updates, releases, events, and they're able to get a good glimpse of what we're working on. Um, and to talk more about tools, Delta Lake uh, uses a variety of their own and also from the Linux Foundation. So when we're working with virtual events, we use Bevy um, for email campaigns. We're using HubSpot. Um, a great community management tool is Common Room. Um, we're able to look at who's really um, engaging with Delta Lake on social media across all channels, whether that be Reddit or um, LinkedIn, Twitter. We also have um, Sprout Social, which is where we get most of our social media um, scheduling and metrics from. And speaking of social media, um, this is definitely um, a big success for Delta Lake in the last year. Um, we ended up growing our LinkedIn to over 20,000 followers, um, which was a really awesome milestone. Um, as you can see here, I pulled metrics from the last year. Um, we're getting about 
92,000 uh, link clicks and engagements about 146,000. But you can see this chart over time, how much um, the ebbs and flows our audience has gone through. Um, you'll notice some peaks around um, summits and conferences and some dips in um, holiday times. But we also um, do a lot on email. Um, we distribute releases via email. Um, we have newsletters and a lot of different um, event notifications. Denny has some really awesome sessions like his um, Ask Us Anything um, sessions, which we live stream to LinkedIn, um, Zoom, and YouTube. We also have Delta Lake discussions with Denny Lee, um, which Denny interviews thought leaders um, in the space and community members, everyone on our LinkedIn are able to uh, ask questions live. And the Linux Foundation team is monitoring and doing the event logistics on the back end. So as you can see here, this is our Bevy page with the Linux Foundation. We have all of our upcoming events and all of our past events. So if anyone wants to ever check out um, different discussions we've had, they can always visit our Bevy. And it's also featured on our YouTube. Awesome. And there's a variety of ways to join the community. So I'll pass that over to Denny. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carly. So one of the reasons uh, I, Carly and I together decided that we want to talk about this is that even though I start off with this concept of saying it's all about the developer, all about the developer, all about the developer, and developer relations means I'm having an engineer and an engineer conversation, you notice that in order for us to boost it, though, there's a lot of logistics, a lot of events, lots of social that has to be done in the back end. And that's what I mean by the partnership with the Linux Foundation, that we're working closely with Carly so she can go ahead and figure out what are the right programs, what are the right mechanisms, so we can ensure that all the work that each of the individual community members are doing are actually getting boosted, are actually getting recognized, that we go out of our way to recognize these users. So for example, you go to Delta.io or GitHub or our Slack or our Twitter, that's great, come on board. But the reality also is, is that each one of these avenues we're giving opportunities, we ensure we're giving opportunities to each and every one of the Delta Lake community, not just the maintainers, I mean, not, and not just the contributors, even just users in general, giving them letting them have the ability to have a voice to tell us what's wrong with the project, not just what's right. We don't want to go ahead and just be told, hey, everything's great. Every project has its ups and downs. Every project has its own issues. We want to make sure that they're able to voice even the problems because that means they know that they're being heard. That's how we make the project better. And in the end, the reason we're also con uh, collaborating with the Lynx Foundation is not just about all the logos here, though that's really cool, it's also because we're working closely with other Linux Foundation projects. One of the things I love to call out is FinOS. Traditionally, you're going, wait, you're talking about a financial organization? Yes, we're talking about a financial organization. In the end, open source is not just about being magnanimous to the community. Don't get me wrong, that's a good thing too. The reality is, what are the potential commercial or enterprise opportunities when you build these open source projects? Well, working with FinOps means we're working together closely with the financial organizations as well. So they're using not just Delta Lake and MLflow, well, that's obviously a good thing from our opinion, but all the other Linux Foundation projects. These are important things to actually happen. And so it's not, it's really, it's about collaboration of developers, of open source, and I know people find it weird when I say this, but also business. And so in the end, we wanted just to end today's session, just to show like, we have this really cool slide that says, hey, we're the most widely used lake house format in the world, 11.1 .1 million downloads, blah, blah, blah. But here's the call out. Every single month, there's a contribution of some release and tracking it has become a nightmare because we have so many different things. How do you think we track that? If we expected the engineers to do it, it would all be a gigantic cluster. <laughs> That's all it would be. It's because we're working with the Linux Foundation to help us advertise, to help us track, help us get the emails out, help us socialize, so we can showcase what we're doing. Otherwise, nobody would be able to understand what's going on. So in the end, 
the most important aspect when it comes to building these communities isn't just about saying, hey, let's go ahead and write some really great code. It's also about us collaborating from the aspect of marketing, social, media, all these other aspects that we work really closely with the Linux Foundation so we can ensure that we're boosting all that. Okay, so that's it really for today. Any questions, go for it. Otherwise than that, I think we're good to go. Go. Cool. <laughs> yeah, okay, I think we're good. <laughs> Oh, sure, what about it, yeah. Basically, each, each month we have multiple releases of different projects within Delta. So like, for example, if you look at May of last year, that's when we released Delta 1.0 and Delta Sharing 0.1. And then June, Delta Rust Python 0.5 bindings. July, Delta Rust 0.4. August, Delta Sharing 0.2, and so forth and so forth. So each month, yeah, we're releasing, then we release Flink, we release Chino, we release Presto, like just, we kept on, each, the reason that the downloads are going up is because we keep releasing more stuff. And the, thing, and the whole point is that it's the community that's releasing the stuff, right? It's not just, like for example, shout out to Trino. Um, I only have numbers from last year because that's all, all I kept it up to, but like literally in December of last year, they, the Trino community pumped out, I think 36, or 40 different like PRs for a single release, just, just for Delta Lake alone. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. No, 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 this is released on anybody's end. Yeah, like that's, that's related to Delta. Most of the stuff's actually in the Delta um, repo because we have multiple GitHub repos in Delta IO organization, but for using the Trino example, no, that's actually in their own repo. Yeah, so, and so we did want to call out, like, hey, this is when the Trino release happened. Yeah. And then there was some attempt to test that automatically, or it just helps with In fact, that's why she was talking about LFX Insights helps with that. Yes, we're able to track all the releases across all the repositories yeah. and the most active contributors on every repo. Yeah. And churn rates, too. So you can see, oh, are people not staying around? Yeah, the whole kit and caboodle. Yeah, yeah. So if you're part of the Linux Foundation, obviously you can do that. Uh, the, a tool that uh, Carly called out was Common Room as well. We're big fans of that. That can also sort of help with that if you're not an L, uh, L, uh, LFX project. Yeah. You're really able to track not only GitHub on Common Room, you're able to track who's talking about you on Reddit people that have questions about your project um, and give a very nice overview on yeah. all of them combined. Oh yeah, and positive negative sentiment even. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Oh, and one thing too, I just wanted to mention that I should have mentioned earlier, but while we're ending, <laughs> <laughs> I, I was actually at an event um, for Delta Lake and it was a really nice visual, I felt, of the community because um, we were all celebrating the third anniversary, the third birthday of Delta Lake. And I was there getting a group photo of everyone. And when I got everyone together, people started leaving the group shot because they thought, oh, I'm not a huge contributor to this project. I've only done a line of code. And um, Michael Armbrust was like, I don't care what you've contributed to this project. If you have done anything, you have made it what it is today because we needed, whether you made a social post about the project, you've spread awareness, you're part of this, you own a piece of this project. And um, everyone got back in the photo. And that's kind of the, I would say, a really good visual of what the Delta Lake community is about is everyone has a piece of this project, whatever you're doing, whether you're writing 10,000 lines of code or you're making social content or you're attending events, you have an important role. And that's it. <laughs>